Welcome to the Outbound Sales Podcast by Upweek. Join us as we share stories, insights, and advice from leading industry professionals to help you succeed in the world of outbound sales. I'm your host, Chris Zuby. Eric, thank you so much for joining. Um, really appreciate getting the opportunity to speak with you, kind of pick your brain a little bit. Um, just kind of a softball warm-up question. Um, tell me maybe what brought you to sales? Like, how did you end up in sales in general? So um, sales was probably not the first career choice I made. Um, you know, it was I wanted to be a lawyer. and. Uh, go to law school and I took the LSATs back uh, when I graduated college and uh, decided uh, after sitting for the LSATs that this wasn't the way to go. And so my father, my father's always pushed me, my grandfather's always pushed me that I wasn't going to sit around the house and do nothing. And, you know, that was, you know, 30 some odd years ago and you had to go out and find a job. And I was always a a people oriented person. And, you know, my, 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 my uncle was in sales and, you know, I talked to him and he said, you know what, you would be perfect for sales, but you got to start out kind of at the the lower end. So I started out, uh, my first job out of school was going door to door, selling copiers and fax machines, the glorious yep. days <laughs> of doing that. That's, uh, you know, it was, uh, it taught me the basics and mm-hmm. to the basics over and over again. And, you know, I didn't have a fear after that point of rejection because i think where people either they get it or in sales or they don't get it is a fear of rejection and you have to learn it early on and experience it not just learn it but experience it you have to have that experience chris and that's what uh helped me in my career yeah there you go i uh i had done a little bit of door-to-door um the college works painting where you the college kids go knocking on doors pointing out houses that have ugly paint jobs. Excuse me, would you mind if I painted that? Yeah, you know, Definitely had a, a lot of rejection there. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess um, with regards to sales acceleration, how did you end up there? Is that uh, what attracted uh, yeah, you to that so, organization? So I had I had ended up at SalesX, a couple people that um, um, I had worked with in the past uh, were at Sales Acceleration. What's what we do um, at Sales Acceleration is we go into companies, help them set up their sales process, help them um, hire the right people in place, and you know if they need be um, their fractional sales leader. And I've always wanted to do things on my own, and you know this gives me the opportunity to work with a couple companies at a time, and you know experience more people and, and really hire people to my strengths and use my strengths to help companies uh, that are either stuck or they want to grow at a, a quicker pace. And pardon my ignorance, but when you say fractional sales, is what does that really mean? Uh, fractional sales leader. So I'm not there full time. I'm not there full time. I'm there on a you know fractional basis where I I um, I lend my expertise to them. And you know it's companies where they need a sales leader but don't need somebody full time. They need the expertise of the position but don't need them full time. And having somebody right. full time would not have the ROI that someone like me would bring where I come in with processes and I can get them running up quicker. Understood. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What what tends to be your your core focus or does it change dramatically based off um, of the circumstance? You know what there's a there's a core focus of setting up the right infrastructure in place. If you have the right foundation to a house and you build up from that, um you will do uh do fine. Um, you know, most companies that I work with don't have the right foundation. I help them build that foundation together. You know, it's just not me. And then we put, we help hire the right people and put the right people in the right seats. That's really what it takes. It's a, you know, it's a people process and then the right technology for them to be productive. Yeah, got it. Um, and so do you work across a variety of different industries and do you see a lot of differences between the industries? It, you know what? You see differences in industries, but they all have the same thing. Sales is sales. You know, you're yeah. you're addressing a problem. You're really addressing a customer's problem. You know, if you're not addressing a customer's problem, you have a widget. You know, it's either, mm-hmm. you know, you're helping a customer add to their um, top line business, help them decrease costs or improve oper- 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 operational efficiencies. If you do all three, you have a home run. If you do two, that's a double, you know, kind of very good. If you do one, you're doing okay. If you do none, you know, it's kind of like uh, the show Shark Tank. Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank says, (laughs) if you don't do any of those, you have a hobby. You have a hobby. You don't have a business. This is just a hobby. You know, the... The days of the product will sell itself in a lot of the 
and a lot of the industries I work in is is not um, not the way to go in the B2B space. And I guess, do you notice overarching similarities kind of in like the, the customer journey as far as yeah, like I mean, their customer experience journey, goes? Yeah, customer journey, people are coming more prepared in the process. They're coming more educated with the internet out there and the information that's out there. They've done, you know, base one of their research you know, kind of tier one of their research, they're coming with, you know, perceptions that may be right or wrong. You have to flush out those percent of the, those perceptions, but at the end of the day is addressing the needs that they have and really, you know, focusing on the need, the problem, what, what you're focused on to help them be more successful, you know, and then, you know, most people, most salespeople want to make it about them. It's about the customer. If you make it about the customer, they will do much better. Yeah, that, that kind of leads into what my next question was, which is what does your average salesperson misunderstand about the, the customer journey? Is that kind of the answer right there? Yeah, I, I, I think it's that, but I think it's at the end of the day is not realizing, um, asking very um, open-ended questions. You know, most salespeople want to ask the yes, no question because they want an answer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's okay. You know, I consider myself when I go in somewhere more of um, a surgeon where I'm going to diagnose, you know, uh, before I prescribe, you know, most, most surgeons, when they do something, they, they don't want to do the surgery. They want to, you know, help somebody and, you know, make sure that, um, you know, they really need the surgery because all things could happen. There's all sorts of complications that can happen. And you want to make sure it's right for them and right for you. And that's where our, I think if most salespeople take the um, sales approach of helping a customer versus, you know, just selling something, they will do much better. Yeah, I, I tend to talk a lot uh, with my team about like tone and and just like tonality and the best way to be trust trusted is to be trustworthy. You know, and that yep. I feel like a lot of times that can just come across in the way that you approach somebody. And if you are actually looking out for someone's best interest, then they're going to feel that and they're going to really appreciate that. So, um, you've, you've obviously spent a lot of your career building up these infrastructures, um, helping sales professionals. I guess, what are some of the main core pieces that you put in place on an average? I mean, it comes to technology, it comes to people, like what are kind of those core building blocks? So, so it's, it's having the right process, the right roadmap is the right steps in a sales cycle from first contact from that first, you know, hello to when somebody actually purchases to them being a lifelong customer. There's also, there's all steps along the way to follow. And, you know, it's, uh, it's the steps on, on the um, salesperson side of what they're going to do and what they'll provide. And it's the steps that the client needs to provide, the prospect that needs to provide back. It's the information that um, is key in this process. The more information you have from a prospect, the better you're going to, to do. I mean, you're, you're going to know more. The more you know about their business and the problem, the better you're apt to help them in the process. And if you establish, you know, the right framework and the right steps in the process. It's kind of like a sports team. I use the sports analogy. If you have a system in place, like the New England Patriots, very, very, mm -hmm. very uh, successful uh, sports franchise, you know, they had, they built a system and then they put the right people in the right places in the system where they did their jobs. And then the, the coach, you know, Bill Belichick, you know, was there to help, but he got out of the way, you know, mm -hmm. Most of the time he got out of the way. Yeah, he may be calling a play, but, you know, he gave people the option to do other things. And they had, a, you know, great leaders in place. And if you have, you know, great people in place, um, you're able to be more successful, you know, and, and people people say having a process in place is micromanagement. It's not. It's uh, it's following the right framework. You know, like when you, you know, build a house, you follow steps or you build a puzzle, you follow steps. And if you skip a step, you're going to notice that it's not going to turn out right. It's the same thing in sales. It's the same same formula to, to follow. Yeah. Or do, you, do you find that there are specific data points that you're looking for? Are you trying to figure out like, are you like a lot of times I'm working like a math problem for my customers? It's like, well, if we can get you this many, you know, extra meetings on your calendar, that should equate to a specific ROI. Are you, are you looking for those types of data points? Yeah, are you I, trying I to drive at pain? Like, I think the data points are, you know, when you look at what the the company, like their their prospects are trying to accomplish with their their product or their solution, there's got to be a defined ROI. And it's, you know, either those three things that I said before, you know, top line, bottom line, or 
or improve the operation is is having those be very tangible in the process is make them as tangible as you can that you know the prospect doesn't have to connect the dots our mm -hmm. job as salespeople connect the dots you connect the dots for them draw the picture make sure it's the right picture that they'll understand and make sure it it's got the facts, you know, it's about the facts. It's about the numbers. And, you know, when, when you draw, draw the picture for them and connect the dots for them, the light switch goes on and somebody says, yes, this is exactly what I need to do. Like, you know, it could be in your business where, you know, you need uh, X number of appointments drives X number of conversations to, you know, to have, to, to, to get a sale. It's the same thing that I go through with companies. You got to have X number of conversations to get X number of meetings to, mm -hmm. you know, to have X number of pipeline. You know, you have that, you know, it's the top, it's that uh, top of the funnel approach. It's building that top of the funnel to get to the bottom of the funnel. And, I'm sorry, but you're not going to close everything. You're not to be all end all to everybody. I hate to tell people that, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't get chosen, you know, plus or minus it's, you know, sometimes you're just not the right fit. Yeah. Back, back to like the qualification kind of piece where we're trying to figure out, you know, the math problem to solve for the, the prospect's needs. Do you ever run into people that are a little hesitant to give you that information because they they know the game you're trying to play where you're just going to build out an ROI for them. Like, do you use yeah, it? Is this I, something that you see that requires a lot of tact? Yeah, I, I, I think it requires a lot of tact, but I think it actually, if you flip it, if you have the empathy approach and say, listen, I, this is what we've done for other customers before. And we've been in this situation and you're there as the trusted advisor approach and you're, you know, you're selling, but not selling. You're actually indirectly selling is you're giving to them as, okay, this is part of what we need to do together to be successful. And, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, appointment setting or, you know, you know, or a tangible, you know, software product or, or something that's going to help their business run better um, is having the approach of, you know, what does this mean if you're able to have more sales, more success, you know, what does that mean to you, you know, and the company, you know, when, if you ask all these questions, it's about question, you know, one of the trainings I took early on in my career was question-based selling. And it's a, just a philosophy I, I follow today is, you know what, ask open-ended questions. Those types of salespeople that ask the yes, no questions, well, you're going to get a yes, no answer. Like, be careful. You're going to get the, yeah. it's a finite answer. That's very finite. Yes or no. Like you want to be able to get more information to ask a follow-up question, to ask the follow-on yep. question and don't draw a conclusion. Don't draw a conclusion until you've exhausted everything. Yeah. On that note, do you have like a handful of default open-ended questions that you'd see yourself going back to the well on that, that work really well yeah, for I you? Mean, or? I mean, I like people to tell me more about their business and tell, tell, tell me more about them first and the kind of, you know, why, why, you know, why they're looking for something like this, you know, tell me why, you know, it's kind of like, you know what, people in my business, you know, know your why, know why you do this, know why you're approaching this and, you know, and the what, you know, what problem were we trying to solve? You know, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, those types of things where you get people talking about them and their business, that's what it's about. It's not about, always about your product or your service. It's about them. You know, they're investing in, in, in your company and uh, at the end of the day, you have to deliver something for them with that investment. So it's about yeah. getting to those issues and, you know, seeing if you're the right fit, because not, not always are you going to be the right fit. I like that. The, the tell me mores, the, the hows, the whys, the what's, you know, just it's, it's, drive and get more info. It's, it's about asking the questions in a very thoughtful manner. You know, when you brought it back to being thoughtful, it's about being thoughtful of people's time. You know, being thoughtful of somebody's time, setting the conversation right in the beginning is, you know, I always ask the question, what are you, what, what are you trying to accomplish with this conversation today? What are you trying to get out of it? You know, and, and make sure we're on the right page and you set the right foundation, the right tone up front to, okay, you know, to take me through this or, you know, take me through how you're doing this today. And, you know, you get people talking and, you know, people are at the end of the conversations, they're like, but you haven't told me anything about you mm -hmm. or, or, or your mm -hmm. product. Well, now I flip it. Now you've, you've earned the right to, to flip the conversation. Yeah. I, I I feel like it gets a lot of coverage, but it is so important just having genuine curiosity, right? Like when somebody asks you a question and they seem like they really want to know the answer, you, you can't help but answer it. You just, you want to answer it, right? But if somebody asks that same question, what are you trying to accomplish here today? 
you know, with like a flat tone, like that could really come off in the wrong way, even though it's the same question. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, it's the tone of how you ask it, you know, it's not what you ask, it's how you ask it. And, you know, you gotta be thoughtful, you gotta be thoughtful, empathetic, empathetic of people's, you know, time and, and what they're trying to accomplish. On the, on the note of like empathy and transparency, um, do you feel that uh, when there's coming to following the process and following the structure, do you also feel that maybe there's a balance with being able to kind of be nimble and kind of be able Correct. to kind of pivot yeah. on a dime? Yeah, you need to be nimble. You don't have to be so rigid in a process, but you want a, uh, a map to follow. It's kind of like, and I'll use an example. I like to use analogies. It's kind of like when I grew up as a kid, um, we would go on road trips. And when we went on road trips, there was one of two things. Your, uh, my father would either have the Rand McNally map. You know, he had a map to put on a dashboard and we'd circle from one point to another and we drew the route. Well, we drew the route, but inherently we would have to stop at a gas station because we were lost, you know, because it's a it was a fine, fine art. And, you know, I think today we rely on too much on technology, but, you know, not instinct, the instinct of, you know, what to do next. And that's, that's the lost art with salespeople, you know, between art and science, people ask that question is sales an art or a science? Well, it's a combination of both. It's really a combination of both to get to an end point of, you know, being successful. Absolutely. Um, I guess. With regards to the customer journey, when communicating high value information to a customer, how can sales professionals identify the specific need of each customer and tailor that approach and message without it sounding inauthentic? So that was a big mouthful. Uh, yeah, well, it's okay. It's okay. It's a big question. Uh, not that you'll get a big answer from a big question. I yeah. think it's, you know, it's to come back and make things in simple terms. Is you, you, you want to be you know simple, thoughtful, and ask a question where you don't know the answer, but you can be um, knowledgeable on the answer. You know, have some knowledge to ask a, a, um, a follow-up question. So for instance, you're talking with, you know, a financial person where this may not be your expertise. It's their expertise where you can learn something from them and say, okay, uh, I understand that, but can you tell me more about that? And you get people talking more about what the actual problem that they're trying to solve, you know, and, you know, I think at the end of the day is when you look at trying to solve problems, the more information you have, the better you're going to be able to solve those problems. I mean, having limited information, you're going to solve a, a limited problem, you know, and, and where, where I see the more successful salespeople are is they really know how to have the conversation. It's not an interview. It's not an interview. It's not an interrogation. It's it's a conversation. Like we're, you know, mm-hmm. talking, you know, two guys across the table having a beer is, you know, that's what we're having the conversation. And you develop a relationship, you develop rapport very quickly. And, you know, you're able to what I call move the needle. Well, you move the needle in a positive direction and you move it, you know, in, in a very concise manner. You mm-hmm. know, I like that. And I guess for, when it comes to like, you had mentioned, you ask a bunch of questions on the front end, you really gain that perspective for where the customer is. And then once you've kind of earned that right to turn the table, that's when you kind of start steering the ship and kind of go in your direction. Do you feel that once that change has happened, that it's important to maintain control of the conversation? Or do you feel that there's some give and take there still? Well, well, I think there's give and take, you know, there's, there's controlling a conversation and actually being in control of a conversation. It's different. There's a difference. It's controlling the conversation is you need to have every word and it's it's not a thoughtful way, but being in control, it's very thoughtful because you can say, okay, can you take me through that? Or you are directing versus, you know, being directed or, or controlling. Absolutely. And I, I always go back to, in my mind, um, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but uh, The Art of War, the old uh, yep. Chinese text, where it says the best game plan is one that is easily adjusted. So kind of having that approach and having that game plan, but being able to pivot at any given moment is going to be what leads to greater success. You know, I learned I learned something, you know, very early on in college that not all paths in life are straight. You know, there are going to be curves. There's going to be curves along the way, and you have to be able to adapt to those curves. And it's the same thing in sales is you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to, you know, pivot, adapt, 
um, turn, turn right here, turn left here, um, know how fast to go, know how slow to go. It's, it's all a balance. That's what I call it. It's all a balance. You know, you can't, you can't just, you know, have the first call and expect them to sign the contract on the first call. The one call closer is, you know, not there. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, there's a, a movie uh, where one of the actors would say, uh, sell me this pen. You know, here's a pen, sell me this pen. And come on, it's just, you know, it's like, you know, it's like that uh, there's a, a meme out there where, you know, during an interview, the, the hiring manager says, sell me this laptop. So the interviewee takes the laptop away and he walks out the door and somebody says, why do you do that? He goes, well, you don't have a laptop anymore. You need one. So you have a need, you know, I yeah. mean, so you got to know when to ingest the uh, humor and, um, and being human in these conversations and not robotic. And, you know, there, there is establishing and really being professional. And I think that's the lost art here. And it's, it's, I help companies where, you know, we go in, we help them with sales process, but we also mentor people. We mentor future leaders. We mentor, um, you know, salespeople to, you know, do the right things and do the right things by the customer. That's what it's about. Yeah. I know it's probably like choosing children, but if you had to pick between what's more important, having the right process in place or having the right people in place to run the process, what would you, what would you say there? I think it's a combination of both. I hate to say it, but you, you have to have a combination of both because if you don't have the right process, it doesn't matter if you have the right people. And if you don't have the right people, it doesn't matter if you have the right process. So it, it's 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 one where, you know, I, I, I kind of look at um, if you have the, uh, the, the map done, like you could do it yourself. The best is do it yourself projects. Like I, I've seen people replace the elbow to their sink. Well, it's very easy. It's two, it's two things you just do and the elbow comes off, but inherently you can replace it, go up to Home Depot and, or go to YouTube and there's a video, there's a video on YouTube. You follow the, and then you turn on the water and what happens? Drip, 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 drip. Things go come out where you should have called the plumber where you should have called the plumber. It's kind of like that. It's kind of, you should have called the expert to do this. You know, even though you you're equipped to do it is you're equipped technically to do it or, you know, from your, your aspect, you may need to be coached along the way or have the right process in place to do it. Is there a specific like number that you would attribute to like opportunity lost by not having those right processes in place? Is that, I'm guessing that's kind of a variable depending on the organization. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's variable depending on company that, you know, the, the, the smaller companies get affected more by that as opposed to the bigger companies, smaller companies, startups that I work with kind of, they're affected more by not having that foundation in place as opposed to some of the bigger companies where they already have, you know, run right. They already have customers. They, they can withstand a, a bad process or no process a little bit longer than yeah. your startup where you need the revenue and you need everything to be um, on the same page. As far as like, you wouldn't say you're wasting 20% of your efforts or you might as well throw 20% of your revenue in the garbage. Like that's kind of no, a hard no, thing to No, no, no. I don't, I don't think there's a percentage. It really depends on the company. It really depends on what the industry is and, you know, how they go to market and how many people they have in place. Yeah. Is 20% the right number? Could be. But I think at the end of the day, it, it, it really depends on the company. You know, there there is... You know the losses of the the loss of sales opportunity cost of not having all this done right. I mean, there's opportunity costs when people leave a company too, and not having the right people hired in place, and not doing things right from the beginning. You know, and I, I said if if people have a blank sheet of paper and they're able to do this right from the beginning, they will have a higher degree of success following a process and hiring the right people than somebody that doesn't do it. Uh, I get um, kind of winding things down just a little bit. Um, if you just more just general type question, like if you could offer one piece of wisdom to an, a growing outbound sales team, like what's maybe that most important piece? Uh, be persistent, but be professional. Um, it's going to take anywhere between eight and 12 touches before you get a hand raise. So, you know, make sure that you don't give up because most salespeople or, you know, sales professionals give up after three touches. It's just a known fact. Um, you know, it takes time. It takes time to be successful. It doesn't happen on the first call. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, I got, um, 
um, great, uh, great knowledge from my grandfather is he said, you have two ears and one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you speak. And those people that do that, it's, it's tough because you want to just speak and you want to, mm. you know, tell, 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 tell. It's listen, 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 and then tell. Yeah, I've, I've always found that uh, even if it's totally not true, a person that's not speaking tends to seem like a smarter person than the person that's speaking a lot of times. You can kind of give the impression that you're absorbing everything and people will kind of see that and kind of respect that, even if you're not any smarter than the next guy or, or whatever. It'll just work in your favor to kind of sit and absorb a little bit longer and a little bit more. So I, I agree with that sentiment a lot. Um, in your opinion, with the way that technology is kind of being incorporated across sales, uh, how do you see the future of sales developing? And I guess, what are your thoughts in general, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, the way things have been going? I think it's good. I think it's good. I think, you know, um, but let me just give you technology is good, but you still need the people interaction. You still need that person to interact and, um, you know, go one-to-one, -one, you know, unless, you know, we're all going to be replaced by robots, which I don't think is going to happen. You know, AI, mm -hmm. AI can only do so much, but, you know, having the right information about, you know, who you're calling on and, you know, is going to be um, more paramount in the future because it's going to, it's going to help in the sales process. You know, like, you know, I, I grew up in sales without computers. You know, I grew up with just a, a manual phone, you know, that's what we did. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I instruct um, and I go into sales, uh, sales organization for the first time, I, I, I come in with note cards, like, and they're, they're, they're like, what's that? That's what I did when we first started. I know we're not there, but if you have information is being able to share information amongst a group of people and being able to make decisions quickly is who's the right prospect for you? Who's your ICP, your ideal client profile, and be able to work the ones that are ideal for you? Because there's people that are going to be ideal for you and not. And staying where it's, I call it staying in your lane, staying in your lane where it's going to be ideal and you're going to have a higher degree of success versus the spaghetti theory where you throw, throw whatever, whatever you can against the wall and you see what sticks. Not going to work anymore, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I want to pick at that a little bit because I feel like there's always a balance between I mean, especially with technology facilitating us to be able to reach out to essentially as many people as we want to as quickly as we possibly can, right? Um, how do you teach the balance or how do you think about the balance between being really spot on and kind of knowing everything you need to know about a prospect? But obviously that takes a lot of time to do that research versus getting an extra 20 touches out and hoping that one of those 20 were to work? Well, it's a combination of both. You have to do both. You can't just do one or the other. You have to do both. It's it's a um, it's a volume and velocity, you know, type type business. It's one where, you know, when you're reaching out to somebody and if you get somebody on the phone, it's that moment of, it's the moment of truth. It's the moment of what do I say next? Besides hello, Fair. besides hello, what do you say? Mm -hmm. And the hello, how are you? My name is, you know, it's- <laughs> It's those things. And, you know, I think with technology, there's all sorts of good things that happen, but there's all sorts of bad things. The good things are is the information that you have about a company and about a person are enhanced. You have a higher degree of success to have a better conversation. The, the flip side of that, let me give you the flip side, is relying on just that information where it may not be 100% correct is where people fall down, they falter, and they're not going to have have very thoughtful conversations where they're going to rely on that information and technology instead of asking the right questions. It yeah. gets back to what we discussed before. They're not going to have those right yeah. questions. 100%. And also to add to that, like they're picking from the same pool of information as everybody else is. So if I yep. get a promotion or I switch jobs, the next 50 emails I get are all, hey, congratulations on the new job. Congratulations on the new job, which if you're one of one, well, that's a nice message. But if I've got 50 of them, how do you stand out with that right. same level of information? Right. I think it's, you know, like when I, you know, reach out to somebody on LinkedIn for the first time, you want to be more about them and not about you. You kind of say, you know, I, I, I'd like to know if I can help you. And then, you know, in your business and, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. And if you can, you can. If you can't, you can't. You move on. You know, you move on, you part of ways as friends, you keep in comp you keep in contact with them, you do kind of more of a, a drip campaign, um, where you, you know, get to know them over time. Um, one of the things uh, you know, that I'll 
I'll help companies with in the process is do do the right outbound campaign. You know, what is the right outbound campaign? Is it calling every day, calling every other day? No, I I, I think, you know, in a lot of the companies that I've worked with in the last uh, two years is uh, we've employed what's called the three by three campaign is we do a call and then an email, a call and then an email the next week and a call and email every week for three weeks and then cycle it for 13 weeks. But in the interim, they're getting information, whether that's from LinkedIn, a LinkedIn post, a newsletter, those kinds of things. But they're re- really constantly keeping them top of mind because when they when they are in the market, you want them to say, yeah, I, I think of Chris for this. You yeah, know, I think this is the Chris first person this. I think of. This is top of mind. I just right. saw an email. Correct. You know, but most most salespeople will quit after that third touch. They'll be like, oh, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm out. Mm-hmm. But you constantly have that. You cycle them through and, you know, you give examples. You know, a lot in the beginning of the sales process is giving. You know, people don't understand is giving information, giving your time and, you know, giving the right things to solve a problem. So you give to get. That's the the lay of the land. That's the, the word of law. Awesome. Um, well, this has been a really great session. Um, is there anything maybe that you wanted to, to quick plug or or kind of? Leave no, no, with? no. I mean, if any, if any, um, anybody out there um, would like some more information, they could um, contact me. I'm at um, eballis, E-B-A-L-I-S, at sales, S-A-L-E-S, acceleration, X, acceleration, C-E-L-E-R-A-T-I-O-N.com. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn and, uh, you know, here to help here to help you and help you in your careers and your companies. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, no, awesome meeting with you. Thanks so much for your time. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure. So thanks so much for joining. Thank you. The Outbound Sales Podcast is brought to you by Uplead, the premier source for accurate B2B data you need to connect with and close your most valuable buyers. With a focus on data accuracy, Uplead offers a 95 plus percent accuracy guarantee. To learn more about how Uplead can help you find accurate B2B data of the people you want to do business with, visit our website at www.uplead.com. Don't forget to search for the Outbound Sales Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts to stay updated on all of our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and we hope you find value in each episode.